Hi, I'm Tracy Mode. Today I want to take a look at working from reference photos. Here in the Pacific Northwest in the winter, it can be very gray, rainy, dreary, icy, and cold, and I sure don't want to be out in those conditions painting plain air. So it's really important that I have reference photos to work from. But in in those reference photos, they do present some uh, challenges for us. We face some challenges in that, so we're going to talk about that in the video. And I also want to take you through um, a couple of ways of working out a value sketch, a value plan. If you have your values right, the chances of a successful painting are much, much higher. So it's really important. I'm learning the value <laughs> of value sketches. I haven't always been good at it, I will admit, but I'm getting better. So let's take a look at this little barn scene. And if you want to follow along, go ahead and grab your supplies. And don't forget to hit, hit subscribe if you like this video and want to see more. So let's get started working out our painting value plan. Okay, so here's the reference photo that I'll be working from. And... I love this barn. It's since been torn down. It used to be in uh, Lake Oswego. It was a little dark dog park here. And they tore it down and made some sports fields and, and some more dog park areas and rebuilt this barn into something not as cute, not with as much character. So I'm glad I took the picture and preserved a memory of it so I could paint from it from time to time. Um, in this photo, um, it's not exactly the way I want it, so that's a pro one of the problems we run into with reference photos. Oftentimes, you snap a shot and the com composition might be a little um, wonky and you want to adjust it a little bit, or the colors might not be right, or the lighting might not be right. As in this case, I took this on a somewhat hazy day, and I want to make this into a much brighter um, scene with a sunset and a lot more light, a lot more pizzazz. So I have to do a little visioneering and use my imagination and change things around a bit and not be stuck on copying the photo. One thing I want to point out here in the photo is that a couple of things I intend to remove. I don't think the buildings back here necessarily do anything for the composition. This guy I'm going to take out. I'm just going to make it a simple scene, simple barn scene with the sunset. The fence comes straight across my picture, and that blocks the eye from traveling through the picture. It's literally fenced me in, fenced me out, so to speak. So I want to break that up a little bit, not make it such a solid line there. So we'll see how that works out as I get started painting. Um, another thing to point out that I do like in this, and I can play up a little bit, is some of the directional lines that I see happening. I've got a line that goes up kind of at an angle here, and imagine that coming up and zigzagging back down, and this kind of zags back down this way. So I've got kind of a nice little uh, directional line taking place already that I can play up on. And I intend, this is my intention, is to use this light area as a lead-in to the painting so I can use the light and bring your eye up here, bring it over, bring it back here and back down to the barn. And I should make this area a high impact. This is going to be a dark, dark side, this part right here. So we're going to work those issues out in a value sketch. I'm not sure where my focal point should be, where my center of interest is. is it is it the whole barn? Is it just one side of the barn? And how can I um, how can I play that up and make that work for me in the picture? So that was my segue into value sketches. I have a little pad under here that I've done a couple. I should have flipped that back to the first page. Um, a couple of little teeny tiny thumbnails, and I'll show you this is like a four by six 
4x6 Super Deluxe Mixed Media by B Paper Company. And it's uh, acid-free, so you can do in their natural white, medium rough surface, um, two distinct surfaces. So this side is smooth, and the other side is uh, medium rough. I don't consider that very rough. However, I feel it's a more cold press. I have a bigger book that I'm going to do a more detailed value sketch and then a color study as well as we get into this video. So I'm going to flip my pages here. My idea was uh, no tan and that is a Japanese technique of balancing lights and darks. So I kind of started off with that idea. I wasn't real pleased with the way it turned out except I love the impact that the light has. I went too dark on that one side, so I flip the page and I start over and do another one. I uh, got the light on this side and I had more of that directional line going there and here, so I had that going for this little thumbnail, but I still felt like I wanted a little bit more information on how the light and shadow was gonna work out. So I flip the page, I do it one more time, and I like this much better. It's not a no tan. Now a no tan is a very, very simple, light, dark, medium value. And that was my intention. And I got a little bit, a little bit carried away, which doesn't surprise me. I tend to do that. So this turned into more of a detailed value sketch, which I liked it. It was fine. This one I thought, mm, I'm going to move back toward the no tan and try to simplify it. Wasn't super thrilled with that. This one was a little bit more satisfying. And then I thought, ooh, I want to see how this brush works and I'll add some lavender into it. So that's why <laughs> that's why it's got color in that part of it. I was just experimenting and that's really important to do. I don't uh, get stuck, get hung up on just doing one thing. So um, I put the lavender in there. This one literally was a less than five minute value sketch. Right before I climbed into bed, I'm like, I'm gonna get my brush out and some dark paint and just do real quick. This is the one I was most happy with because it just looks fresh. Everything kind of came together. The values are good. I've got the directional lines going. I've got a good light on that side of the barn. And I was really happy with that. So I didn't go further. I closed the book and went to bed. <laughs> so um, yeah, like I said, this, this is my value or my photo reference here. And in doing the value sketch part of it, you can use tube grays or tube blacks if you want, lamp black or something like this. I have a couple of grays here that I could have used, but I ended up mixing my own and we're gonna talk about that. So I do wanna swatch these out a little bit so you can see what that looks like. So I'm gonna get my brush wet and I don't have these colors on my palette in one of the trays, but I'm just gonna put a tiny touch of the neutral tint there. I don't want too much on there because I don't use it very much. So I'm gonna grab a paper towel. Always have a paper towel in my hand to soak up excess water from my brush if I feel like there's too much in there or too much paint, I'll kind of touch it onto my paper towel. I also have a sponge handy that I dab my uh, brush in to kind of soak up some of that excess. So right now, this is neutral tint. I'm just gonna add a swatch down here and kind of bring it down so you can see. It's a kind of a blue, blue gray, purpley, Got a little purple tint to it. I really, I do really like neutral tint. Um, it's great in clouds. You can get some good cloudy skies. Payne's gray is as well. So that's what I'm putting down next. Next to the neutral tint. When I do these swatches, I do like to 
label them so I know what it was that I was using there. So this is Payne's Gray. These are both Holbein colors, although the different brands will have them. But important to note within the different brands, you get uh, colors that don't always look the same from brand to brand. So you may have a neutral tint that looks a little different if you got it from Daniel Smith or Windsor and Newton. So this one, Payne's Gray, is a little less purpley. It's a little more of a true gray. I like both of those, so um, I do use them from time to time. But when I'm doing darks and when I'm doing value studies, I think it's fun -er to mix up my own blacks because when they dry and settle, you've got some really cool uh, variations because the colors don't always settle in the same way. So it's fun to have a good variety of darks in your arsenal that you know about, that you've learned about and practiced using so you can just auto, just on autopilot go and mix up your blacks. This one I pre-mixed and it is Van Dyke Brown, again, a Holbein color, Prussian Blue, also Holbein, and Alizarin Crimson. I believe I have Daniel Smith Alizarin in my palette. So those three colors are what we're going to swatch out next. And again, I'm going to try to get a thick, thick start to that and rinse my brush off and kind of bring... See how I came below? I wanted the majority of water to be down here so I didn't go right into my my gray or my, my dark. So this one has more of a green and we'll see what happens when that dries. We'll come back and take a look at that if I can remember. That's always the challenge. Next, one of my go-to blacks is alizarin crimson. I'm going to just mix that up in this little area. So I've got a thick alizarin and I think I'll add a little bit more. Don't really need that for what we're doing, but I tend to mix up bigger puddles. Like I said, that was Daniel Smith. Then I've got a blue and it's a Holbein color, royal blue. I always have that on my palette because it's a super dark blue. And that is important when you're mixing your own darks. You want pretty much three, two, three dark, dark colors. So now I've got a purple with those two colors and then I'm going to go to my darkest green pretty much and that would be hookers spin wheel and I'm going to add that to my paint mix here I've got a little more green that I want so all I have to do when that happens is go to one of the other colors I used. In this case, I'm gonna go red because red and green are complements and that's gonna take away the greenness of that hooker's green. Now it's a little more red than I want. Oops. But instead of going to the hooker's green, I'm just gonna to go to a blue, that royal blue. Again, I'm gonna go grab tiny touch of hookers and that looks like it's about right. So it's a it's one of those things you just have to play around with color mixing until you get to the uh, right color that you want. So one um, way to learn about colors and how they mix together is to pay attention to the color wheel to learn your color wheel. So Plug, plugging the color wheel. So I'm going to add a little bit more and come down. So this is um, pretty gray as well. I really like that dark. So four different darks that, that um, you can do. Two are tube 
darks, neutral tint. How do you spell neutral? N-E, neutral. And Payne's gray. Gray. Uh, this one was Van Dyke. Brown. Prussian blue, which is very dark. And alizarin. And this one was alizarin. Royal blue. And hooker's green. Green. So you've got some, some options with just a few colors. Already I can see the very beautiful way that these two uh, two end grays that I mixed myself are settling. So we'll come back and look at that. I'm gonna set it aside so it can dry. And one thing to point out about the drying is I could dry it with a hair dryer, but what happens when you do that is you interrupt the process of the paint settling into the nooks and crannies, the grooves, the divots, or whatever you want to call them of the paper. And that's one of the beautiful things about watercolor is how it settles and granulates and the colors separate. So I like to be able to do that if I can, just let it dry on its own so it has a chance to settle. There is a point that in the drying time that I feel like that's all it's it's done all it's going to do and then I'll break out the hair dryer and finish up the process. So uh, that being said, let's move on and I'm not going to do any of the thumbnails. I'm just going to move on to a value sketch and I do want to clean up my water real quick. It's very important to have clean water. I don't want to go into murky, dirty water when I'm starting a fresh painting, particularly. Okay, so before I open my book, which I'll show you on here, is a Canson Montval watercolor uh, sketchbook. It's a five and a half by eight and a half, um, 140 pound cold press, Really good color lifting. This does not say acid free. So I, anything that doesn't actually say that it is apple, apple free, <laughs> acid free, I just am gonna assume that it's not. So this uh, could yellow over time, but it is just a sketchbook. It is just, you know, something we use to kind of slap down ideas and that kind of thing. Um, I put, I took some notes so I wouldn't forget to uh, say these things. One thing um, I mentioned was the composition can be off a little bit. So that's one of the problems we face with reference photos. All And also colors tend to flatten out. Uh, shadows can look black instead of having the beautiful uh, color that can bounce around and we can play with that as we paint. It also, uh, there's too much detail. It, the camera just captures a lot of detail that we normally wouldn't really see with our, um, our eye when we're looking at it in real time, in real life. What we look at, what we're focusing on is clear but then everything outside of that kind of becomes a little bit blurred. And it's uh, really cool to be able to play around with that in our paintings as well. And let's see, they uh, it's often really um, easy to want to copy exactly what you see. And that's why I'm taking this out. I don't want to copy the guy in there. I'm not going to copy that the fence is straight across. I have to remember that I can simplify a scene. I can remove items from the photo that don't um, benefit my composition or make my painting better. In fact, they could make it worse. So uh, we'll look at, uh, look at the photo and determine, okay, what can I remove? What can I move? This tree doesn't have to stay there. It could move to this side if I wanted it to. This is just a point of reference. So this uh, little tool here is a little piece of uh, red cellophane. 
and it really helps us to see value. It takes the color out of these photos, and Eric Rhodes on Streamline Art Video has giveaways on his um, shows, and he has a pair of what's called value specs, and their um, lens is this red. So I think that would be really cool to have. You wouldn't have to be, you know, hanging onto a piece of cellophane outside and the wind takes it and blows it away. But it's a really great tool for seeing just exactly how the values look in a scene. So I'll set that aside too. I want to keep my reference photo here. And I don't really need to move that. So tuck that away. Tuck this away. We're not going to need that anymore. So I'm gonna open up my little sketchbook. I've already made a tiny little drawing of that barn, and this is just gonna be the value sketch of that. I'm gonna use, um, I think initially, I'm gonna start with this um, number 10 Escota Versatile, and then probably move on to a smaller brush. This is a, uh, brush that holds a ton of water. So at some point in the painting, I like to go to a brush that's uh, synthetic and doesn't hold as much water because um, it can kind of be a little bit tricky to control what you're doing with a really watery brush. So let's just get started with that. I think I want to clean these little puddles up real quick. I go through a lot of paper towels. Okay, so what I'm going to do is get a little of my own mixed up dark here, and I'm just going to start by adding some sky, rinsing my brush. I want it to be soft in some areas. And I can leave a little hard edges. And just coming on down to the horizon line, I wanna come right up against the roof there. And I really am gonna to try to control myself and not add too much detail. I got to remember this is a little study. It's a value sketch trying to figure out what I want to do. Easy, right? Just slap on the color. It's not uh, not too difficult. So now I'm going to go down to a number eight Utrecht if I can find it. Aha, oh, it's trying to hide from me. Okay, so now I want to go into, I'm going to go with my barn, actually. I'm going to start on this shadow side here. And really get dark. I'm trying to stay away from that wet sky, so I'm leaving a little bit of an edge. It's not quite going to be dark enough, so just grabbed a very thick mixture. And I'm just going to drop that in real quick. And what I like to do, too, is remember to make connections. So where... That little line is there. I'm going to come over and make some connection, a connection there. That also, that little light and dark interaction here is helping to um, show that light side brighter. And I think I want to come up in here a little bit. I'm 
little connecting point here where the windows connect to that shadow under the roof edge. And then I can add a little bit of water down here. I don't want too much paint, but kind of want that barn to kind of melt into the foreground a little bit. Going to leave a light edge there. And then I'm remembering that I wanted some directional lines. I've got to remember what I was intending to begin with. So I do like how that looks. Each time is different. Every time I've done a scene multiple times, there's little variations. So I'm gonna do just a tiny little line up here. And the rest is kind of defined by the sky. Also, I'm gonna come across there with that tree line up above, so. Okay, so I've got that established pretty well. I like how that looks. Um, and I'm gonna drop down to an even smaller brush here and dip into that and get, hopefully I can get that. It's got a nice tip on it. This is a Princeton. Long round number two, number two. Another thing to point out um, is knowing having a, a value scale. So when I'm doing a scene like this and there's a strong shadow, it's more believable if the shadow side of that building is about 40% darker than the sunlit side. So tuck that away. And now I'm gonna come back up with, I'm gonna go with a number six Utrecht. And we're just gonna play with the trees. That looks now, that looks like a little, um, <laughs> I should put a rooster on top of it. I'm gonna go dark with those trees. Really don't need to be concerned about what kind of trees they are at this point. I might decide I want them to be deciduous and not evergreen. Now what I want to do is come across a little bit lighter. So I just rinsed my brush and I'm dragging some of that color, just dragging it over rather than adding more pigment to it. So let's come right to the edge of that roof. And grabbed a little bit more pigment there. Again, I'm just gonna drag it across and create that roof line. Grabbing a little bit more pigment, and I'm gonna kind of connect these shapes, leave a little light area in between. So I want this, I could have done that later. I should have maybe done that after I laid in these background trees. I got a little ahead of myself, so. Sometimes that happens too. I just jump around and I go get excited about putting something dark in. So that's what happened. That's my story. And then I could add much darker and it's still wet back there. So that looks like maybe some trees that are a little more in front of the background ones there. 
and I'm gonna butt right up against that. So those shapes kind of connect. Making sure to leave some of the lighter edges. It's okay to add a little bit of indication of grass, but again, I gotta remind myself this is a value sketch. I don't need a lot of information, just um, little indications of what I want. Okay, so I like where this is. Now, if I want to have that fence in there, I would put, probably put it maybe over here and maybe not so much on this side. I might put it back behind instead of in front of this barn. So let's just do that. Just a couple of lines to indicate it and some posts. And yeah, let's just do a little back there. And I kind of like to make those lines a little bit crooked. So it looks like, you know, the fence has kind of fallen down a little bit, needs repair. And that can blend into that building, that barn. Let's do this. And I really didn't even need to come across that. I could have left, left the fence right on the edge of that. So let's just kind of get rid of it. All right, that is it. This maybe is a little bit darker than I want, so I'm gonna lift some of that out. And you see what I'm saying? I have a tendency to wanna to keep going on it, but that's just a very easy, simple value scene. And I'm gonna let that dry so I can flip to my next page and then we'll work on getting color into this. So let's let this dry for a minute. Okie dokie. So it's had a good drying time. It's a little bit bent, but really that's not too bad on this paper. Sometimes some of these sketchbooks can get all uh, lumpy and warped and um, it's not fun to paint on, but this is pretty good. So I'm happy with it. I have used Strathmore before and I really don't like how, how it gets so... Um, what am I trying to say? There's so many valleys and the water settles in those and ju it just makes it really hard to work with. So this is now dry um, and it, it didn't really, sh I can't really see the granulation so much. This is a pretty smooth textured paper, but this uh, Van Dyke Prussian and Alizarin version, which I'm using in my value sketch here, it, it really has a nice subtle, um, green tint to it. And the alizarin in royal blue, it's a, just a really nice, and hooker's green is a really nice dark. So um, those also are not very granulating colors to begin with. So if you were to choose some darker colors that were granulating, you would see that a lot more. You'd see more of the settling of those pigments. So I'm going to set that that aside. I said I was going to show it, so I did. But what I am seeing in here, which is pretty cool, I don't know if you can see it so much. I don't have one of those fancy cameras that zooms, but up in here, there's some, I can see some of that Van Dyke brown, which is really cool. It's kind of swirling around, and it's also down in here. So some parts of my little 
container here probably didn't get mixed thoroughly, which that's fine too. I really actually kind of like how that looked. So I'm going to flip the page and we're going to move on to our val or a color study. And I think what I'll do here, since I can't view this one at the same time that I'm painting that one, unless I cut it out of my book, which I really don't want to do. I'm just going to go to this guy to reference from. I am not so much going to use the photo, but I rather want to use my uh, black and white so I can really get an idea and remember what I want to do as far as the values are concerned. 